what could go right here is that you plant a landscape that is so productive that it produces food all year around for you. I had food every single day of the year out of the urban farm for over a decade. There is only one place on the planet that lack lives. You know, lack, lack like not having enough. There's only one place on the planet that lives. It's in between our ears. Because when we look at the abundance that can come from nature, it is mind-blowing. We human beings think we know how to do it better than nature and want to control nature, and that slows the process down. Get out of the way of nature. Grow a garden. Welcome to the Regenerative Real Estate Podcast, a show about human environments and how they can be used as a force for good. Conversations that educate and inspire people looking for a different way to do real estate. I'm Neil Collins, and today I'm joined by Greg Peterson, a consummate educator, community builder, and sustainability innovator that founded the platform, The Urban Farm. As a podcast host of the show, I get pitched a lot of different stories and ideas. I find that generally the themes fall into two different categories. And it's interesting because it's unbelievable how many people out there want to educate you, dear listeners, on how to exploit real estate to the maximum fullest gain through strategies such as fix and flipping 100 homes a year or how to get started in mobile home park investing. Now, it's easy for me to filter these people out because there's already a million other real estate shows that cater to this crowd, and I personally don't want to be another cog in that wheel. But the thing that really gets me are all the people that pitch to come onto the show that can be loosely categorized into this new earth utopian style community. These are the eco-villages in places like Costa Rica that cater to the American and digital nomad where they sell dreams of cheaper, more sustainable lifestyles far away from capitalistic Western society. These communities often tout bountiful food forests, renewable energy systems, and horizontal governance structures. But as tempting as that may sound to my millennial brain, what I'm more interested in is how we change the culture around real estate. This is things like urban planning, design, development, finance, and property ownership. Because this is where the real work needs to happen. We have over 10,000 cities in the world today, and they already have tens of trillions of dollars worth of resources sunk into infrastructure. This is where real impact can take place. You see... We live in a complex living world where no one is immune from things like climate change and macroeconomic forces. And rather than trying to simply squeeze more juice out of the system like the majority of the real estate industry, or on the other hand, escape and create entirely new communities in foreign lands, I say that it's about time we roll up our sleeves and focus on creating resilient homes habitats, and communities. This is where our guest, Greg Peterson, enters into the picture. Greg has a great story that begins with being struck by gardening from a very young age. He became fascinated with permaculture as a young man, but felt like he needed to adapt the language to be more approachable. And over the years, Greg began to create a food forest in his own yard, But this wasn't in a far off country, but in Phoenix, Arizona. And maybe that is a far off country to some of you. And for context, Phoenix 
is in the middle of the desert and it is a very unsuspecting place to start an urban farm. Greg is the founder of the educational platform and podcast of the same name, The Urban Farmer. And he has a great story about how he was able to create his own life purpose statement and go on to become a community catalyst to spur local action in urban yards across the desert and the country. If you take anything away from this podcast episode, it is that we can create resilience and it can start with something as easy as planting a couple fruit trees. Okay, Greg, it's a pleasure pleasure to have you come on the Regenerative Real Estate Podcast. I'm not even really sure where we should pick up your background because I think that we run the jeopardy of of going down some really fun, fun paths. And I thought you lived still in Phoenix, Arizona, and I had read this headline that new development that was already permitted was halted because they're running out of water. Water, like, yes. I can't wait to talk to Greg about this because he's oh. he's been doing stuff in Phoenix for a long time. But um, and we can and we can talk about that. I actually am still fairly plugged into Phoenix. I um, after living fifty four years in Phoenix, I decided I wanted to go someplace quieter than four point seven million people, and we moved to just outside of Asheville, purchased a farm here. So I'm still plugged into Phoenix. You know, and especially the water issues. In fact, we do a yearly water harvesting summit primarily because the water issues of what we're having in the Southwest. So mm. well, I think that that's a really extraordinary uh, pinpoint that we should put into moving to a new place and, and what, what you do whenever you've got a new canvas and a new place that you're you're starting to get familiar with and dream into. Why don't we back up and what's a good place to start on your journey? Ah, well, so we're going to go back to when I was nine. It was 1970 and I wanted to get a fish aquarium because I was interested in growing fish for food. And my parents thought I was a little nutty, but they said, all right, if you can raise some money, you can buy a fish aquarium. So I got a fish aquarium after I got my paper route. That was my first business. I've been self-employed for almost 50 years. And fast forward to 1974, I wrote a paper on how we were overfishing the oceans. I was 14 in the eighth grade. So back then, I knew that there was something inherently wrong with the way we were eating and living on the planet hmm. back then. And in 1981, I was on the board of the Arizona Aquaculture Association. That's a fish farming association that was in Arizona in the early 80s. And we went and visited a farm. And they were raising fish on this farm. They were harvesting the fish and throwing away the what was left over after the fish meat, which is about 70% of the fish. And I just looked at that and it was like, wow, that is such a waste. And my brain thinks regeneratively. Mm. basically what that means is how can we use everything in the system? So I wrote this, I mapped out this fish farm that only raised things that could be used. Everything got used in the system. So the fish stuff left over was fertilizer. And, you know, I, I had this, this map of how we could design regenerative fish farms back in 1981. Fast forward 10 years. This 1991, I'm standing at my mailbox and there's this flyer that shows up in the mailbox on permaculture. It's like perma what? I'm I'm getting chills as I share this story because I still remember that moment. And this was before emails. I pulled this flyer out of the mailbox and read about what a permaculture design course is. 72 hour in person class. And I ran in, I was married at the time. I ran in and I said, Michelle, I'm going to do this course. You want to do it with me? So my partner, Michelle, and I did the permaculture design course together. And what I discovered in that 72 hour course was there was something that I could call the way that I think. Because remember, 10 years before, I designed a regenerative fish farm. 
because waste makes no sense to me. Throwing something away is like, what is that about? How can we reuse it, recycle it, repurpose it? And so, and then three other things that happened for me in 1991 that were really pivotal is I discovered a book called Ishmael by Daniel Quinn. It's a gorilla and a man. The gorilla is the teacher, and the gorilla is teaching how we got to be where we're at today from an agricultural perspective. It is a mind blowing work of fiction. Mm. That is, in many ways, true to what we do in our culture. The third thing that happened for me in that 1991 year was that I did a course at Landmark Education called the Advanced Course. And there they do webinars and seminars and all kinds of stuff. They still do it to this day. And the course was about creating your vision for your life. And the vision that I created for my life was... I am the person on the planet responsible for transforming our global food system. We have a very broken global food system now. It delivers food in real time. Well, it delivers manufactured food in real time. And that in itself is magical. However, it's not good food for us in all cases. So that's what I stand for every day is transforming our global food system. And now I know I can't do it all myself. That's why I do the urban farm podcast. That's why I do the education I do so that people can see that the most important thing we need to be doing right now is figuring out where our food comes from and how to grow our own. Now there was a fourth thing that happened. A friend of mine went sailing in the South Pacific and they anchored at an, an Island looking for a grocery store. And the people that lived on the island looked at them funny and said, "Uh, go pick your own. And for me, that was like the creme de la creme of this adventure that I went on in my the first 30 years of my life. It's like, wow, food used to be free. This is I'm quoting Daniel Quinn. Food used to be free and then we locked it up. So what if we created landscapes that were inherently edible? And the place that I created, I bought in 1989. I lived at that the urban farm in Phoenix. It was a third of an acre. That's 80 feet wide and 160 feet deep. I uh, had 80 fruit trees, rainwater harvesting, chickens in the backyard, gardens growing everywhere. It was what we called an old growth food forest in the middle of the desert in Phoenix, where there was one or 10 or 20 things to eat every day that I could just go out and wild harvest because I, the way I designed the landscape is that it self perpetuated every year. Things went to seed like carrots went to seed and they spread carrot seeds. And so that carrots would grow in the yard or lettuce or basil or parsley or nasturtiums or cowpeas, which are a kind of bean that are really edible. There were literally dozens and dozens of things that would grow every year in the landscape that All I had to do was go out and forage them, harvest them. And 2001, I was back in school at Arizona State University getting my bachelor's in urban planning and my master's in urban and environmental planning. And what I discovered then was that I was doing what I wanted to do at the urban farm, an environmental showcase in Phoenix. So I opened it up in 2001. My home, I opened up for tours on a monthly basis. And over the 20 years that I did tours at the urban farm in Phoenix, we probably put 10,000 people through the front and backyard for them to see an an permaculture edible landscape in action. So there you go. That brings me to today and uh, no longer live in Phoenix. I now live in Asheville, North Carolina and four acres. Well, I've I've got a couple of things that I'd love to to just pick up there. Uh, Starting with who in 1991 is sending flyers about permaculture design certificates in Phoenix, Arizona. There was an organization back then based in Santa Fe, New Mexico, and with offices in Tucson, Arizona, called the uh, Permaculture Drylands Institute. And to this day, I have no idea how they got my information. The flyer just showed up and they were offering a permaculture design course in Phoenix, Arizona. 
and you know we jumped in yeah that's incredible i remember picking up permaculture probably 2008 2009 Mm -hmm. and and not even realizing that it it wasn't mainstream and i was in the peace corps and i was trying to find resources on how to do you know low tech but high productivity agricultural design systems to work with these agrarian farmers in eastern europe oh wow and my my mother has a master's in horticulture and my father has a a bachelor's in agronomy so i i was like so how do you actually design these permaculture systems and and they both looked at me like they had no idea what i was talking about wow and I'm like, you know permaculture right and they're like what the heck is permaculture and <laughs> And I was like, well, I don't know. They're, it's also talking about biodynamic agriculture. I'm like, what's biodynamic agriculture? And I'm wow. like, okay, interesting. But I could, that's 20 some odd years after you're, you've taken your permaculture design certificate. And what an interesting way to have that coincide with the landmark. Like, what is your vision? Yeah. And I, I find that so critical for the basis of my work and, and what, what we are are working with our community around is like, what's your role? What's that vision? And and how do you yeah. in, integrate in? And so what does it really look like for you to do that and, and to do the work? Yeah, well, and that's really a, an important piece. Having something that gets you up out of bed in the morning, having a vision, having that piece for me, here, here I am 32 years after Landmark and Permaculture Design course, and I still live my, I am the person on the planet responsible for transforming our global food system. The value for me in that was life-changing at the time, and it inspires me every single day. Well, if you were able to to get it to a point where you've got this old growth food force on your property, like where, fill in those years between 91 to maybe mid 2000s of just how do you get going on that? And what are those community interactions? Like, did it inspire other people or did they just think that you're this crazy guy trying to grow food in his yard? Very good question. And what I learned in my permaculture design course, and I love my teachers from my PDC in 1991. They were absolutely brilliant. And Tim was a Vietnam vet. And he was the main teacher in the course. And he was very much a hippie and very much targeted at a very close-knit group of people. And what I understood was that if I was going to make this a mainstream word, I needed to get it to be a mainstream concept. So from when I did my permaculture design course well into the, you know, 2010s, 2015s, I used to call it the P word. And I didn't use it because here's the problem that people have with the P word. It's a word based in English that people already have an assumption that they know what that what it means. And I was, I was doing this thing. This was 93, 94. Uh, I immediately, after I graduated from my permaculture design course, I immediately started teaching it. We did intro to permaculture. We did, uh, you know, short things about it. And I was at this public festival or something in, I'm going to guess, 94, 95. And this guy raised his hand and he said, Greg, there's no way that you can do permaculture in the desert. He totally missed the point. The point is permaculture looks at the ecosystem where you're living at and uses those systems from that ecosystem to to further build your ecosystem around you. So what I realized in those moments was that I needed to mainstream permaculture. So I, for 15 years, I stepped away from the P word and I called it sustainable. Now we call it regenerative. Those are better words. Back then, if if Bill Mollison and David Holmgren would have called it something like feng shui, 
It would have been an easier word. Obviously, feng shui goes way back farther than they do, but it would have been an easier word for people not to understand. Given it's an English-based word, people already think they make the make up what it means in English, and it gets in the way of us teaching people how to do permaculture. Because permaculture for me is the art and science of working with nature. Now, how do we plug in and work in the flow of nature? And that starts with observation. So from my home space perspective, from the home space that I have, both in Phoenix for 32 years and now on my four acres in Asheville, I'm observing. I often tell people, spend at least a year on a property before you make any changes. You have to know what's going to happen in your space over the course of four seasons in order to make wise decisions. We had planned three months into our move here that we would have a greenhouse built. Guess what? If we'd have built a greenhouse last year, it would have been in the wrong place, Hmm. built in the wrong way. I know better now. Whether we build a greenhouse this year or not, I don't know. I'm still observing. But I now know a year later where my gardens are going and I've started installing them. I think this is where the seasoned designers, gardeners, things like that, they have their own definition of, of observation. Mm-hmm. But, but maybe for those folks that are, are coming into this conversation, what are the observation techniques or what are you really driving for? Like I had Mary Reynolds on the podcast and she's amazing. Oh, she's she's like, take your shoes off and walk around the property and do these go. things. Uh, but go. what what are you really looking to observe over that, let's say, 12-month period? Right. We'll start with the utilities of our house. Find out where all your utilities are at. Know where your water is coming in from. Know where your electricity is coming in from. Know where your sewage is going out from know where your gas is coming in from, that is a valuable piece of data. And there's, there's in every state of the United States, there's, I think they call it 811. In Arizona, it was AZ811. And you can just call them and they will come out and mark utilities for you. So knowing where your utilities are at is really good. Number two thing to observe for is incoming resources in the form of water, What's the water flow like on your property? Where does it come from? Where does it go? And it might not just be rainwater. For what we're doing, we got to have water. So discover every single way you can that you have to water your property. And it, like I said, it's not just rainwater. In Phoenix, I had city water. I had flood irrigation in Phoenix. That's a story in itself. I had second use water coming from my evaporative cooler on my roof. I had second use water coming out of the condensation from my air conditioning unit. Believe it or not, in July and August in Arizona, it puts out a lot of water. And then we used gray water. Gray water is any water that goes down any sink of your house, except your toilet and your kitchen sink. And it is legal in Arizona and most states to use that in your landscape. Here in Asheville, we're on a well. So discover where your water resource is at. Then pay attention to the prevailing wind. Where's the wind coming from? On our property, we have wild animals. We have bears and deer and turkeys and squirrels. And so pay attention to those kinds of things. A really important thing to pay attention to is where's the sun at at any particular time of the year in the sky. If you're planting a garden and you put it in the northern hemisphere, if you put your garden on the north side of a structure, it's not going to get any sun. So knowing where the sun travels throughout the year is really important. I tell people all the time, on December 21st, on March 21st, on June 21st, and on September 21st, go out at noon or go out on all day on those days and pay attention to the arc of the sun. Observe for that. So those kinds of things. For us, I had to discover where there was a flat piece of land that 
would be sufficient for an 18 by 36 greenhouse. Because I lived in Phoenix for 54 years. It's warm and hot there. I moved to some place that gets this white stuff in the wintertime that falls from the sky. And it's like, okay, if I'm going to move here, I need a greenhouse. So finding that flat spot, but then watching to see if it gets sunlight. So those kinds of things. Um, if we would have put our chicken coop in a year ago, it would have been in the wrong place because of the flow of how we want to use our property and the flow of wild animals that come through the property. We have to build a cr predator-proof chicken coop for our chickens. Well, first thing I did was I built a privacy fence two months ago after I'd been on the property 11 months. I knew that I, I wanted a privacy fence from the side street. That also is a predator fence. It keeps some of the predators out. And so it, those are the kinds of things that we observe for. Hmm. That's interesting. Yeah, I, I love that you started with utilities as well. It looks more broadly and holistically at our dwelling and, and how the, our space is impacted by these structures and oh, yeah. um, like there's the, this whole resiliency piece too. Like if we can understand really where, where our money is going as well Amen. and utilizing some of these resources that like, it, it's amazing that your brain from a young age went straight to circularity and not, and having this aversion to waste because yep. in our culture, it's just, we've spent decades now more than a century of figuring out how to remove a lot of these nutrient flows and, and streamline energy and make it very, quote unquote, efficient, much to our detriment that we're all starting yeah. to collectively realize. Right. Um, but being able to, to see those flows and, and I love how permaculture can is a good entry point into just pulling back the curtain a little bit to say, huh? Yeah, how how might we use this? Um, but also, it starts, it starts yeah. with observation. It starts. That's uh, for me. The first tenet of permaculture is observe. And when you're done observing, you make some changes, then observe, and make some changes, and then observe, and make some changes, and then observe. It's an ongoing process. Permaculture and permaculture systems is not a destination. It is a journey. It is a process by which we learn what's going to work best as we work through the process. After 30 years at the urban farm of me pondering how I was going to shade my driveway, I was on a walk about three years ago in my neighborhood in Phoenix, and I saw it. After living on, and studying permaculture for over 25 years, I saw it. It was in one of my neighbor's houses, and it was a mesquite tree planted in a particular place next to the driveway. So what did I do that year? I found a mesquite tree and I planted it in that place after over 25 years of living on the property. So observation never stops. Just like learning never stops. We need to continue to learn what works best and what doesn't and then and then make that make changes so that we work better in the flow. Maybe I'm I'm projecting here from my own lived experience, but I can be a bit hesitant, dare say I trepidatious to to want to experiment because I don't want to screw it up. Now my partner Alyssa is amazing. She's just like, we're going for it. Uh, <laughs> and and that's where I'm trying to figure out because we we work with a lot of people within the the built environment what what is home and and how they they can live more in harmony with nature uh, but especially towards the millennial generation and and even younger there's this hesitancy that i find because there's not a fluency or an ecological understanding do you think it's valuable to work with permaculture designers or experienced landscape designers to to really take a lot of the heavy lifting or a lot of the the guesswork out of it from up front? Or do you Absolutely. really like the grassroots like trial and error approach? Let me tell you a story. So I run a fruit tree education program in Phoenix. 
I've been doing it for 24 years. We educate people how to grow fruit trees in their yard, and then they can buy fruit trees from us. And I worked with a lady maybe 10 years ago, and she had previously purchased three or $4,000 worth of fruit trees, planted them in her, in her yard, and most of them died. Three or $4,000, dead, gone, poof. I offer, in, in, for the low desert, I offer one-hour consults on the phone for people's fruit trees and gardens. And she hired me. And when we were done with our hour on the phone, she said, oh, my God, I've learned so much here. And if I would have spent $120 with you on a consult, I would have saved $3,000 in dead trees. So I am absolutely a proponent of education. Do a permaculture design course. Find one in your city and do one. Hire consultants where it works for you. And, you know, do both. Because without experimenting, we're not going to learn. On my podcast, I have the Urban Farm Podcast, and on my podcast, one of the final follow-up questions, so I get people's stories, and then I ask them five questions. And one of the questions is, tell me about a time you failed and what you learned from it. Because we learn in our failures. Now, we want to minimize our failures as much as possible, but if you do something and then fail at it, you know what not to do next time. And I promise you, that I have killed more fruit trees than you have. <laughs> Probably exponentially more fruit trees. Not on purpose, but I was big time into experimenting in Phoenix. And that's how I developed my fruit tree program in Phoenix is I know what grows in Phoenix. And if you buy fruit trees from us, first of all, you get me on the other end of an email if you've got a problem with your fruit tree. Secondly, you get free classes every year. We give dozens of free classes. So we do all of our education free. And then you get fruit trees that I have vetted that I know that if you do exactly what I tell you to do in three years, you're going to be getting so much fruit, you're not going to know what to do with it all. And that came from trial and error and hiring consultants. So it's a mix of, mm. you know, to answer your question, it's a mix. And yeah. be open to learning. An observation that I found is that whenever we transformed our yard in, in Portland, Oregon, when we were living there, into more of an edible and perennial landscape that other people on the block started to uh, take notice. You know, yes. it, and it was at first like the neighbor that we knew really well. And then somebody a little bit further down the street, they were, became more comfortable with understanding that we just had this like perpetual wood chip pile in the middle of the road. But you were at, you've been at this game a lot longer than we have. So what what does it look like to have 10,000 people go through your property that is a demonstration mm -hmm. that that really flies in the face of convention especially in a place like Phoenix, Arizona. I mean Portland's a little bit like known for that like homesteady urban vibe, but I wouldn't say Phoenix has that that moniker. So what it does not <laughs> does not so first of all i grew most of the food on the property in our front yard on purpose and the urban farm touring and e ecosystem sharing happened so i went back to college uh, when i was 39 years old i got a, a bachelor's in urban planning plant biology and uh, sociology and a master's in urban and environmental planning. And what I knew was that I had to craft a conversation that the planning department would love, the city planning department and neighborhood services, because if somebody called and complained, that was a problem. So I designed the landscape so that it fit into the neighborhood on purpose that was edible so that when people walked by, there was a citrus hedge all along the front of the property. They could harvest citrus if they wanted to. And so I purposely made sure that I was building something that was palatable for the masses. Mm -hmm. And then what I did, and I encourage you and anybody that has a, a landscape like this, put the word out and do tours. 
So when I started doing tours in 2002 with the Urban Farm, there were Saturdays. I used to do it maybe six Saturdays a year. There were Saturdays when nobody would show up. I'd set up my tent and nobody would show up. Toward the end, we would give four to six tours a weekend. And we would get 40 to 60 people on a tour every time. So we would do one on Friday morning. We would do one on Friday afternoon for a happy hour. We would do two on Saturday morning. So we were bringing in, you know, two to 300 people a weekend that wanted to see what an, a, a, a mainstream edible landscape looked like. And it, this wasn't the kind of tour where, you know, people just arrived when they arrived and they walked through the landscape and left. What we did is we would set up a tent. We would set up a table, tell people to arrive at 8.30 a.m. And the tour would start promptly at 8.32. And I would introduce myself, tell them three to seven minutes about what the urban farm is. And we'd start in the front yard and spend about 30 to 40 minutes in the front yard. And then we'd go into the backyard where the chickens lived and, um, you know, talk about chickens and rainwater harvesting and mulberries and like that. And toward the end of my time there, like I said, we'd get two to 300 people on a weekend and people were inspired. I remember one, one young lady, maybe 10 years ago, come coming on the property and she was in the on the tour and in the front yard and on the backyard. She raised her hand. I remember exactly where she was standing. And she said, oh, my God, there's so much going on here. Where do I start? I don't know where to start. And that was a pivotal moment for me. And the reason it was a pivotal moment for me was that you have to start with one piece. Hmm. What I was doing at the urban farm was a 30-year process by the time I left. It wasn't a 30-day process. So you start by observing, spend time in the space, pay attention to what's going on, and then make one change. Put in one garden bed. Plant three fruit trees. Do things a little at a time because what happens is if we take on too much, we get discouraged and we stop doing it. And that's the last thing we want to do. We want to continue to be inspired by what's happening in our space and have that drive the conversation forward. That's amazing. Yeah. I, a farmer yesterday was, was like, I would just kill myself and, and get so broken down by the time winter came and an older farmer said, you got to start thinking in terms of decades. <laughs> yes, exactly. <laughs> I was at my Phoenix property for three decades and I could easily at 62, I could easily see myself being here at this property for three decades. Hmm. So what did, what does it look like within Phoenix? Like, did you, what are some of those examples that just like really warmed your heart to see the tentacles of that inspiration go out? I started my work in the early nineties. And in many ways, I became the grandfather of the urban farming movement in Phoenix. I was the, I was the big fish in the big pond. and. A lot of people over the years have come to me and said, wow, you inspired me. I get that all the time, both in, on my podcast and in person. And it, that made a huge difference for me. It was, it was something, first of all, I'm fulfilling my goal of transforming our local food system in Phoenix and making a difference for people. So that, that was cool. There's a gentleman, you might want to have him on your podcast. He's amazing. His name is Zach Brooks. He started a project called Arizona Worm Farm. And he bought 10 acres in South Phoenix, which was the, the not great part of Phoenix. And he has created a off-grid home. It's his goal to grow enough food so that he can feed the people that work on the farm, like all year round, he is really doing what I'm planning to do here. He's doing it there. He's doing the project that I would have loved to do in Phoenix. And I don't know this to be a fact, but I'm, I'm making up that some of that inspiration for him to do that came from the work that I 
planted over the course of the, you know, three decades in Phoenix. And I, many times I recently had a gentleman on my podcast, um, and he emailed me about six months ago and he said, Greg, I've been listening to your podcast and watching what you do in Phoenix for 10 years. And I bought a homestead in Maricopa, which is outside of Phoenix. And now I'm doing what you shared. And so I had him on my podcast. That's what my podcast is all about, is sharing people's stories of inspiration. So mm -hmm. things like that happen a lot with me. And I, and I love that. It's, it's, it feeds my need and want to do more of this. Mm. I want to know, whenever you decided to leave Arizona to go to North Carolina, this is the real estate side of me, what, what did you do with the house? I mean, how do you even, did you keep it? Did you sell it? What, <laughs> what happened there? Well, let me go back to 2012. Uh, I was married to my house. And my mom used to call my house, the urban farm, my mistress. Because every time I'd meet a partner, a woman, I it, basically it came down to, okay, you need to move here because the urban farm is a place I can't leave. So in 2012, I moved out of the urban farm. Word got out that I was moving out and selling the urban farm, and I got so much backlash. Oh, my God, you can't sell the urban farm. You can't move out. Your work here is too important. I got lots of people that were really upset. And I was like, no, I'm not selling it. I'm absolutely not selling it. I'm just moving out for a while. I'm renting it to a farmer that's going to do what, continue doing what I'm doing here. So that was a sparkly moment of learning for me. And interestingly enough, after moving out, I met my now partner, life partner, two weeks after I moved out of the urban farm. Ten months later, we had an opportunity to go back, to move back to the urban farm. And we toured the urban farm and she knew what it was. And interestingly enough, that energy that was the mistress energy for me had dissipated by having somebody else live there. So then we moved back uh, and we went back and Heidi and I made it our collective place. So that was a big learning experience for me about how to handle the moving out of the urban farm. So when I decided I was going to move out and sell the urban farm, uh, we looked at putting into a land trust. I know that you had a couple of people on your podcast talking about land trust. And that was a big project that I, I didn't have the energy to undertake. Mm -hmm. But what I did have the energy to do was to paint a picture of what this space was with an amazing real estate agent who I work with now regularly to sell market and sell other urban farms in the Phoenix metropolitan area. And we created a listing that was about the landscape. And interestingly enough, I say we got an extra 50 grand for the landscape, hmm. an old growth food forest with 80 fruit trees with chickens, so on and so on. And we marketed it that way. I marketed it to, I have about 50,000 people on my email list, about 15,000 are in Phoenix. And we basically just marketed it to my list. And this was a year and a half ago. So it was a really hot market, but we weren't looking for those people that were looking for the hot market. We were looking for the right person. We actually got seven bids on the house in 24 hours. Six of them wanted it for the landscape. So in that moment, I really had wished that I had six of the urban farms to sell because I could have picked any of the six of them and they would have been perfect for the space. The people that ultimately purchased the house had been working in Phoenix in the food system for over a decade. They actually had created a community garden for homeless people in downtown Phoenix that I, interestingly enough, a decade earlier had taught classes at. So they ended up purchasing the house and they're continuing the work there. In fact, we will be doing a, I'll be going back to Phoenix in November of this year for my fruit tree program. And we'll be doing tours of the urban farm this year. Oh, wow. I'll be going That's back cool. to that property and they've been, uh, you know, we've, communicated a lot they've become friends and so it was that was my single most important thing was to find somebody 
that would actually carry on the vision of what that space was because it's a valuable community asset in Phoenix. Yeah, finding the next stewards it yeah. is like a, a main theme of our work. How much do you find yourself as someone that has dedicated decades of their life to that property? How much have you let go for them to like settle into their own vision for the property? Like, have they made changes that you know of? Yes. And what was that, that emotional reaction? Here's what I knew. I knew that once I sold the property, I had to completely let go. In fact, the real estate agent and I decided that I would actually be on site for the open house, which is highly unusual. What we did is we put me in the backyard talking about the landscape because many of the people that came to the open house beelined right through the house into the backyard. They wanted to know about the landscape. So I was there to talk about and sell the landscape of the property. And as one of the people were leaving, they she said to me, Greg, I can't buy this place. I'm not going to put a bid on this place because I feel like you're too tied to this place and it would be too much of a too many strings attached once once you sold the property. And that's in that moment, I knew that I had to completely let it go. Mm. And so from that moment on, I told the people that ultimately bought it, I said, listen, I love this place. I spent over half of my life living in, the, in this place. I have my, my life invested in this space. And once you buy it, once we close, it is yours. Whatever you do, I trust you to do what's right for the space, whatever you do, it's your choices. And, you know, they've done some things. I've been back a couple of times and they've done some things that I wouldn't have done, but it's absolutely perfect for them. And it honored the ultimate space, the ultimate edibleness of the space. It, it, that's really what, what is there for me. And the cool thing is, here's the most cool thing about what they did to the space. I lived in the house. It was built in 1949. I lived in the house for 32 years. I lived in the house with a 1949 kitchen. What I did along the way is I replaced the plumbing. I replaced the electrical. I replaced, replaced basically 100% of the uh, infrastructure had been replaced over the years. The ducts in the attic, the uh, uh, insulation, um, it's got to work well for me. Otherwise, it doesn't work. And I kept the kitchen, a 1949 kitchen. About five years ago, I drew up plans. I had an architect draw, draw up plans for what would be a cool kitchen. And what it turned out was it was a demo, three-month demo project where we essentially had to move out. It was that big of a demo project. And I handed them those plans when we left. And they essentially implemented those plans. And what it did for the house, when I sold the house, I knew that if I sold it to a developer, they were going to come in and bulldoze the house. Hmm. And what they did to the house, and this brings me to tears when I think about it, what they did for the house is they gave it another 100 years. Hmm. They did the demo. They did the kitchen. They did the bathrooms. They updated the pieces that I couldn't do that made it not a teardown. Hmm. So I love what they've done with the space and, you know, everything they do, I may not agree with, but it's their space now. Mm -hmm. And they're, they're honoring the vision of the space. Yeah, that's, that's beautiful. It's not very often that you, you get to, you get to see what that transition, that life transition is. Yeah. And it is such an emotional investment. It is. Into a place. And I, one of the the, the moments in, in my career and in, in life is some friends of ours had bought this property that was teeming with life. It was just incredible. Uh, so much intelligence on that embedded in the landscaping. And they ripped all the landscaping out because uh. they wanted to have sod and a place for their kid to kick a soccer ball around despite not having a kid <laughs> and it was 
arguably over $100,000 worth of plants. <laughs> wow. And you just, it, it was one of those moments where I'm like, wow, we are in the industry of helping people move out and start new chapters of their lives. And it's so complex because you're dealing with money and structures that degrade as well as living things and how it comes together. And you're over here just like r- ripping out somebody's manifestation of their dream. Yeah. <laughs> and so there, there's some gravity there that, and some beautiful poetics that are both like heart gripping and also filled with a tinge of like sorrow. Yeah. Here's one more piece. I could have gotten more for the house. Hmm. There were two of the six bids that came in a little higher. But what I wanted to do was make sure that I made the choice that was best for the property. So I left a little bit, not a lot, but I left some money on the table so that that wouldn't happen. Not that the other two people that bid more would have done that, but I wanted to make sure that for me, the right vision person was in the space. And I was was willing to walk away with less money for that. I mean, that that's pretty incredible too, because we've been a part of urban farms where the systems are so heavy that the new buyer just gets crushed. Yeah. And they have no idea how how to actually run it. And the seller might have opted for the most amount of money. I want to ask you one kind of concluding question that I'm curious to see where you're going to go with this. But this is an ode to a lady named Vicki Robbins. She's got a fun podcast where she'd ask a guest, what what could possibly go right? (laughs) And you know, you are so articulate about your role and how you want to fit in and the impact that you want to make. But what it, if your vision really does like continue to come together, I don't want to say like if it comes together, because it sounds like it is. you you are making an impact in the world. What could go right from here? How How can we continue to move in a direction? And what might that look like? I believe that the most important thing that we can be understanding right now is where does our food come from and how to grow our own and one of the projects i started about oh my god about 15 years ago now was 10,000 urban farms in phoenix what if we created 10,000 urban farms in phoenix now that's not enough to feed phoenix but it's a good start and i did some, i did some math about 15 years ago with the help of a mentor you know, how many urban farms would we need in Phoenix in order to feed Phoenix? And I came up with, I don't know, 90,000 or something like that. And an urban farm is anybody growing food in their front and backyard. And being an urban farmer is a distinction that one claims. Because if you're an urban gardener, gardening is a hobby, farming is a profession. So when you say I'm an urban farmer, you're claiming that profession. And there's an intent that you're actually going to farm and grow food. So grow food and share it, number one and two. I don't care if you're just sharing it with your family. And then name your farm. Naming your farm gives it a life of its own. People all over the world know the urban farm because I've been shouting about it on my podcast for the past eight years and in Phoenix for the past 30, 25 years. So what could go right is people could start growing zucchinis and sharing them. Plant fruit trees. I love fruit trees because you plant them once and they get fruit for decades. I had two citrus trees in in the backyard at the urban farm in Phoenix that were over 100 years old, still making fruit. And so what could go right is everybody could plant groceries in their front and backyard. You know, one of the questions I used to get was, what happens if there's too many farmers? Oh my God, wouldn't that be great? What's if there's too much competition? And I used to say, when there's enough people growing enough food in Phoenix to feed Phoenix, then we might think that there might be some competition. So, you know, grow food in your front and backyard. Share it with people. If you have a space with gardens, put it out to your community. It would be easy for you. You're in real estate. What if you, once a year, opened up your garden and showed it off to people and shared with them you don't, you just have to know a little bit more than they do. Shared with them what you're doing. People want to be inspired to do this stuff. 
They want to know how to do it. So what could go right is you could do a tour at your at your farm in Portland, bring people in. And oh, by the way, this is a really important piece because in nature, there's a flow. Put out a donation basket. I did. I still to this day, when we go back to Phoenix in, in the fall to do tours, it's by donation. And you would be really surprised, maybe you'd be really surprised at what people leave in the donation basket. And I used to tell people, make a donation if you can. If you can't, that's fine. We've got lots to share here. And it brings the abundance in. Hmm. What could go right here is that you plant a landscape that is so productive that it produces food all year round for you. I had food every single day of the year out of the urban farm for over a decade. So, you know, I've said this for years. There's only one place on the planet that lack lives. You know, lack, lack like not having enough. There's only one place on the planet that lives. It's in between our ears. Because when we look at the abundance that can come from nature, it is mind-blowing. There's this, there's this friend of mine and person that has bought dozens of fruit trees from me over the years in Phoenix, and she counts how many fruit. She's got, I don't know, four kids, five kids. And they count how many apricots come off of their apricot trees, like 2,000. How many peaches come off of their peach tree, like 800. The abundance from nature is mind-blowing. We human beings think we know how to do it better than nature and want to control nature. And that slows the process down. Get out of the way of nature. Grow Grow a garden. That's what can go right. Ladies and gentlemen, that is exactly why we wanted to have Greg Peterson on this podcast, right? That this is such a, a treat to have you on. What a legacy that that you're leaving. Where can people learn more about you? Pick up your podcast. Where where can we send people to? Uh, first of all, every month we do free classes. You can go to urbanfarm.org, the front page. It's usually listed on the front page. The free class we're doing, um, and they're on Zoom, so you can get them wherever you are in the world. Uh, and we have an events page with all of our events every month. We do have a website, healthysoilhacked.com. If you want to learn about building healthy soil, for sure, check out my podcast. That's urbanfarmpodcast.com. Easy to find. Greg, this has been a real treat. Keep up the great work. I hope it's going really well in your new place in Asheville, North Carolina. And uh, once you start doing those tours, we're count us in. All right. We're, we're, we're loving it here, Neil. And uh, thanks for having me. I greatly appreciate it. And maybe one of these days I should come back and talk about the new farm here that we're building. Absolutely. I'd love that. If you want to follow our work at Latitude, you can follow us on Instagram at latitude.regenerative.re and mine is at I am Neil Collins. We inherently believe in the potential that comes from connecting value-aligned and purpose-driven people together in community. That's why I encourage you to join our mighty network and introduce yourself to the other people working across the globe to advance a more regenerative, resilient, and beautiful world. Here, we want to know what you're working on and what inspires you. Through this platform, you can attend live events, take courses provided by our podcast guests, and create connection with other people and businesses that share your same passion. To join, find the link in our show notes or visit our website at chooselatitude.com. If you'd like to support the show, please share it with your friends and be sure to follow us on your podcast app so that you always have the latest episode downloaded. Another way to support our regenerative field building is to leave us a rating and review on Apple Podcasts. Positive ratings help attract amazing guests, and they can be the deciding factor for someone else to tune in and listen. And who knows? Maybe this is the kind of motivation that it takes for them to finally decide to align their profession with their sustainable and regenerative values and become a positive force for good within their own community. 
This show was produced by myself and edited by Anthony Wallace and offered as a part of our work with Latitude Regenerative Real Estate.